So you dig in the music? Do you say it's kind of like you know? I, I got it. I got a little. Yes, it's exciting. It's like you know, that's the flight of the Valkyrie. You know? It sounded that's like revolutionary. Like, okay. Yeah, no, no, it's not. It's not so much Les Mis. It's more like you know, Apocalypse Now. Uh, so anyway, so uh, welcome as always to the Unified CXM Experience, and uh, I'm your host, Grad Con CXO or Chief Experience Officer at Sprinkler. And today I've got a very special guest, uh, Drew Tambling. Drew is the Director of Influencer and Analyst Relations at Sprinkler. And we're going to be focusing on the analyst relations part of his role as we dig into the how to write a marketing plan and in particular the zero moment of truth stage. So Drew, welcome to the show. I'm going to give you a quick intro. I'll kind of just kind of cover off a little bit of your background. Uh, I'm going to frame up for folks just where we are in this series because uh, this is a kind of an ongoing series of how to write a marketing plan. And then I'll, I'll kind of come to you and have you sort of fill in the pieces of your background I missed and then we'll kind of dig into this. Does that sound okay? Yeah, it sounds good. Thanks. Thanks for All having right. me, Greg. Okay, good. And as always, our uh, erstwhile sound engineer, Randy, is on board and on tap. And Randy, are you, are you on board and on tap? Okay, are you excited? Are you excited? And on tap. You're yeah. very excited? Okay, good. Well, I'm, I'm very excited. excited. I'm a little nervous, actually. Yeah, I always yeah. find you a little intimidating. Yeah, well, he's just too good looking. That's the problem. I don't, know what, I don't know what it is. I get that a lot. Yeah, no, you're just really good looking. And so I think that just makes people feel intimidated. I try <laughs> like to show up. You to like them, right? I so, try to anyway. show up like unkempt and scruffy to kind of throw people <laughs> that off. Just, that know? probably just makes it make even worse, you know? It's like, oh my God, look how unkempt <laughs> and scruffy he is. Uh, anyway, so Drew, uh, Drew has worked with me now for like three and a half years, maybe four years. I think maybe four years now, right? We're getting I think close. I was one of your first, I was one of your first hires. I yeah, think. like kind of April of 2018, I think. So, so uh, Drew was working at Gartner, and Gartner is one of the analyst firms we'll be talking about today, along with Forrester and Constellation and many others. Drew was there. He was in Singapore. And I'm not 100% sure exactly. You can, you can maybe fill this in, Drew, because I've, I, it's sort of lost in the mists of time for me now. But somehow we ran across Drew in Singapore and you know, managed to get him to move to Portland, Oregon. And uh, he has uh, he's now relocated to Fort Lauderdale. So he's sort of been sort of slowly moving uh, east all the time. Uh, and he and I actually live quite close to each other because I'm in Delray Beach and he's in Fort Lauderdale. And you might say, hey, grad, you and Drew probably hang out a lot, right? And I'm like, yeah, you'd think so. <laughs> so, um, so, let me, <laughs> so let me let me go for a second on where we are. So we are talking about how to build a marketing plan. And the sort of concept that I introduced uh, in their first episode on this series was there are sort of three stages that I would look at. It's a little bit of a different way of thinking about writing a marketing plan. But think about what you're doing at the zero moment of truth what you're doing at the first moment of truth and what you're doing at the second moment of truth. We have covered all three of those in sort of overview form. And now we're drilling into each one of those pillars with some special guests and some other discussions in terms of understanding how to think about those. So we actually talked about the zero moment of truth a few days ago with Marshall Kirkpatrick and spent a fair amount of time on how to think about influencers. Marshall did a really nice job of kind of unpacking that for us. And that was a, a really fantastic interview. And of course, Marshall VP of marketing here at Sprinkler as well. Uh, so today we're going to unpack the analyst relations component of the zero moment of truth. And remember zero moment of truth is the stage at which people are researching your company in B2B. This can be the most important stage because most buyers who go to your website for the first time have already made a decision to buy your product. So the zero moment of truth is critical in B2B, but in B2C, increasingly, people are making their decisions based on the word of others. And it's this word of others that has driven the change in buying behavior across the internet. And so that's why I think companies still have a tendency to think about what do I saying about myself and not thinking more clearly about how do they influence others to say the things about them that they want so they get the kind of traffic and business that they need. So, um, so Drew, let's first of all just react a little bit to the zero moment of truth stuff. Tell me if you feel like that's on board, off board, or, or maybe like sort of add some perspective on that from an analyst standpoint. Remind me on how we found you, and then let's just dig into this topic. <laughs> I like the terminology zero moment of truth. Um, it makes me think of a lot of things, and in particular, in a B2B cycle, 
you're always thinking about funnel and where things yeah. fall within a funnel. Right. And quite often here in analyst relations, it, it, that's a tough conversation because you, we, we see analyst assets making making themselves valuable at different points and journeys of 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 the pipeline and not necessarily right. just at that zero moment of truth right. but it might have its most impact at that zero moment so um, that's a great point just let's it, stay there for one second actually you raised something that i'd not thought of before we have talked about buyer enablement quite a bit in the show and i'm not sure i've got that parsed into the model correctly and i've actually i've highlighted that i've noticed that there's this kind of stage sort of half stage somewhere in there about buyer enablement but i think you're right well what happens is a lot of times the assets that these uh, analysts produce are used by people internally to sell their peers on this is a good decision to make right this like uh, you know it's not me saying it's sprinkler is the best it's gartner that's saying sprinkler is the best so you know if it doesn't work out it's not my fault i'm going with what the analysts say is best right and of course it always works out with sprinkler but it's like just you know you have to kind of like i think this adds that third party imprimatur that makes people feel comfortable about a decision and pushing their own peers to sort of align with them uh, how do you see that normally working like do you how do you see people requesting it how do you see people using the materials internally I think it goes so much deeper than that, and it's much more human than that. Okay. So, um, in well, a lot of instances, yeah. Listen, in a lot of instances, when when are we talking about sprinkler? Are we talking about B two B technology sales in general? Anything because, you want. Okay, so let's talk about it like holistically. Yeah. In most enterprises, when somebody has um, has made a business case over a prolonged period of time to invest in a technology like a sprinkler or something else. Yeah. They're often spending seven figures, millions of dollars on implementing a technology like that in hopes that it's going to do what they're expecting it to do. Right. And some folks have tethered the, their career to the success of that program. That's right. 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 And it's a dangerous proposition. So in analyst relations, um, it becomes increasingly more and more, more and more important for the technology that you've stuck your neck out on the line to implement and do and and, and run in the business to be validated by third party uh, analyst firms because that becomes the source of the truth. Right. It says it says it says we've we've enabled this technology and taken these risks because these technology has been validated by the best the best analyst firms in the world and year after year the retention of that business from a sprinkler perspective it becomes infinitely more more simple if you can maintain those leadership positions and validation from third party analyst firms once we start slipping down the quadrants then renewals become risky so we're talking about mm -hmm. is it the zero moment or is there multiple moments and then of course it's that zero moment where people are going to be finding out about us for the first time but what about for those folks that have tethered mm -hmm. the success of their careers to the implementation of a specific technology they need us to be validated continuously by analyst firms you know it's it, uh, my beginning of my career at microsoft i was in healthcare and there's a company in healthcare it's an analyst firm called class k-l-a-s which yeah. is, I think, the initials of the founders. And Class is based in somewhere in the Midwest. And they control and own the whole healthcare IT marketplace. And it's, you essentially live and die by your class rating. And would come out, I think, on a quarterly basis. And, oh my God, we would, like, like pour over these things. And it was, like, death by a thousand cuts or cheers of victory. It was just, it was, yeah. it was oh my, it's so much riding on it. Yeah. And you really could not sell your software if you had a poor class rating. Like you were just mm. dead in the water. Oh and if it slipped, to your point, it created a lot of problems. We would get calls from CIOs saying, what's going on? My board looks at this. My board looks at the class ratings of the stack I've put together. And if it's not top of best of class, I'm going to get criticized for it. You got to get this fixed. It's very interesting. Yeah, you're not even making a short list. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that company, Class, by the way, has been really, really busy with the advent of technologies that have come out um, since COVID and the requirements right. that are placed upon placed upon uh, technology, specifically in remote, uh, like um, medical doctor patient technologies yeah, and right. virtual telehealth virtual, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Health, all that stuff. Yeah. They've been going, they've been they've been blowing up, but. Um, so how do we yeah. find you? This is, let's cover that off real quick before we get into the rest of this, because I know we're going to get deep on the analyst stuff. But 
We are like, um, like you're in Singapore and somehow sprinkler, like what, what <laughs> all happened? I've become a little bit of a digital nomad since COVID kicked off right now. I'm in the Pacific Northwest. Um, shortly I'll be back in Florida and we can get together for a little, uh, boat cruise or something like that. We can do something fun. Um, but uh, you can find me on LinkedIn at Drew Tambling. You can find me at on on Twitter and Instagram at, at Drew Tams as well. But Singapore, like, how did I find you in Singapore? You how didn't. Did I, I didn't. Our, our your previous uh, your your previous PMK leader, Mr. Paul Show, uh, he found me in Paul Singapore. Found you in Singapore. He happened. It was it was wow. so wild. He actually had happened. It was an interesting time in my career. I had spent eight years at Gartner and most of that time helping supply yeah. chain management technology companies to improve their capabilities with analyst relations, whether that meant improving their ability to perform in waves and magic quadrants or actually um, doing a number of other things. But uh, at that time, I had been doing it for seven or eight years. And I was like, you know, I, I want to parlay this experience and start to learn something new. I'd spent seven years in the supply chain management technology space. I'm like, I want to learn a new market. And uh, so I started putting feelers out there and I came, uh, Paul and I got connected and it just felt like it made a lot of sense. It was funny because at that time I was thinking, I want to go to a big tech firm because I had had all this experience working with like Oracles and SAPs and AWSs for years. And I was like, that's the kind of place that makes a lot of sense for me. And after one or two conversations with Paul, I was like, this sprinkler thing sounds pretty awesome. And you know what was pretty cool about it? For me, it was I had spent all this time in this back office technology architecture and the mentality of mm. business leaders in back office technologies. It's very much cost savings driven. It's like right. how much blood can I can I squeeze out of this stone right. in order to make our business more more profitable? Yeah. But then just one or two conversations with Sprinkler, I was like, this is a totally different mindset. It's how can I use technology? to enable top line growth and it's more and it's more of like uh this mentality of being growth driven and aspirational and hungry and it's it's, more, it's a much more exciting space because it's kind of like this unknown territory it's like you can go as far as you as far as you want with this instead of this mentality where it's like how can i just squeeze a little bit more and get well, a little bit more cost savings out of this thing i gotta tell you i am so so happy that you joined us you've made such an incredible difference. And I don't know how Paul found you, but kudos to Paul. Um, Michaud was like awesome. And so yeah, what a great, great story. And, uh, and you're right. I think I, I think I met you in my first couple of weeks on the job. Um, I think I was like signing off on like transferring you from Singapore to Portland and yeah, yeah, it was kind of, it was very, yeah, cool. I came to New York and, and let's, let's, let's talk about oh, this. Yeah. Though. Right. This was fun because you came from a background that was a lot, a lot different than a sprinkler. I mean, at Microsoft and some of your other, some of your other roles before that, but yeah. like you hadn't really done a whole lot of analyst relations stuff. And it was that first conversation we had, I was like, I was like, Hey, grad. So we've, we, we got to have a conversation because I'm like, I don't know anything about marketing, but I know every, I know a lot about this analyst stuff. I've been doing it my whole career. And I remember at that time you told me something that I'll never forget. You said, this is the first time we ever met. We're walking down the street. He said, Drew, anything you're going to learn about marketing right now will be irrelevant by the time you, by the time you learn it. But if you can take the, if you can take the, the analyst stuff that you've spent a career learning and you can apply it here and you come with hunger and, uh, and, um, I think you said energy and a couple other things. He's like, you're going to do pretty good. So I remember at that time, you didn't have a lot of experience. So you kind of like learned alongside me and I taught you like, this is how it's done. This is how it's done. And we quickly, those first couple, those co first couple analyst briefings and stuff that you and I did together. Yeah. Yeah. weren't so great, but we've gotten really tight Yeah, and great. we've got a process now and we've, and we've really, really zoned in on something that works. We're getting results. I mean, even just this past week, um, we've got mentioned in our first analyst report as a CCAS provider. Oh, and that's because really? of the work that that's doing. awesome. Who mentioned yeah. us? Uh, it was uh, it's a it's an analyst community forum called No Jitter. You've oh yeah, I, 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 I sent that to the ELT. Yes, we yeah, I read that. No yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was very cool. Yeah, we've been working a long time to get there. Yeah, that's very cool. Recognized as a newcomer into a market that a lot right. of analysts out there feel like we don't belong anywhere near. Right. So the mindset the mindset's changing, and that's only happening happening through targeted and strategic analyst engagement. All right, so let's 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 figure out who we're going to talk to now. So, 
let's frame this up as I'm a, I'm a tech startup. It doesn't matter what space, right? Just I'm a tech startup and I'm in a space. You know, let's assume okay. I'm in a space that's growing because, you know, I probably wouldn't have done the startup if it was space. Sure. We're not, we're not in peer to peer software. Let's just put it that way. Okay. So sure. we're in something like, you know, 21st century. Um, and let's say I'm in that sort of product market fit stage. Um, and this is typically when I like consult with and then kind of connect with a lot of startups at this sort of early stage, they're kind of like 25 to 50 million in revenue. Clearly they got something going on. They probably got one or two customers that are maybe multi-million dollar customers. Uh, you know, that would have been like me with Sprinkler back in, you know, 20, say 18. Uh, so they've got some proof of concept now that's sort of working and they've got some customers that, boy, if I could just get a hundred of these, then I would be like really smoking and, uh, they're growing quick. Um, but they don't really think about analyst relations, right? That's just not mm. on their, that's not on their mindset. And then maybe some of some stuff's coming out in their category and, and they're in this kind of challenger quadrant suddenly. They didn't even like know it was coming out or they like, so, so they're, and they're just sort of, so they're starting to hear from their board and you got to start to worry about this. So frame up, if you're sort of meeting with that entrepreneur, you're probably meeting with the CEO cause they're probably not even a CMO in place yet. So you're meeting with the CEO and you're chatting with them, how to think about it. How would you coach them up on how to think about analyst relations, how to get it started, what kind of people they need to hire to sort of make that happen? And, and what would the investment curve look like on how they should be spending against it? Yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. Um, and you can be you can be certain that if there is a category that emerges and there's any traction with it, an analyst firm is going to cover it and they are going to introduce an evaluative piece of research to that category. It happened just this past year when COVID hit and everybody's conferences were, were canceled and all this stuff. Everybody needed to, um, needed to divert to virtual, virtual setting for major scale industry conferences, right? So a whole technology category, I'm just giving this as an example, right? A whole technology category emerged. And there was already some companies that were doing stuff there. And then COVID hit and they're like, oh my God, everybody, we're getting so much attention. We don't even have the the, the staff to really manage it, especially yeah. the demand that's coming in. And then of course, analysts turn into, tune into that stuff. They're like, hey, there's this new technology category that's emerging. We need to cover it. And then boom, all of a sudden, these, these nobody technology companies that were just kind of like hanging on to dear life are at the front and center of a category that never existed because COVID happened. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, that actually was a real thing. That was a, a technology category called um, virtual event management softwares. And it was uh, led by Forrester's Laura Ramos. So she picks up this category. It was outside of her traditional uh, coverage as an analyst, but it happens. And so what I, what, what I would advise to companies that find themselves in situations like that um, is, First of all, it doesn't cost any money to brief analysts, right? So you can start. You were asking me earlier, like, can, can you? We we at Sprinkler are a whole di a whole different animal. We have got five product suites. We've got um, you know years and years of development of an analyst relations program, and are doing a lot of different stuff. But to just get started, it doesn't really take much of or or any money. Um, so building those relationships from the ground up can start in a briefing segment in a briefing setting that you can request formally just through the former the formal Gartner and Forrester channels to do some introductory briefings so that analysts can know who you are, what the services that you bring to the table are, get to know your executive leadership team a little bit, and then we can start to build a relationship from there. I don't think that that's a very sustainable model for very long. You will need likely an initial investment to start to have more of a formalized relationship that gives you the ability to have ongoing conversations ad hoc and more frequently than just through the free briefing channels, which is, is, is a very limited channel. Yeah. So, so let's that's, talk about that's that for a second. Important. Okay. I hear you, but I want to like double click on that a little bit because one of the challenges with uh, particularly startup entrepreneurs, as soon as they hear you can do it for free, they immediately assume they can always do it for free and they default to free really quickly. And I actually, what I'm kind of a fond of saying when I'm in some kind of advisory capacity is I'll say that at sort of 25 to 35 million, the biggest line item in your marketing budget should be analyst relations. 
Absolutely. And, that, and let's talk about what's in there, right? So um, let, me, let me kind of skate at an overview level because I'm mostly just like, this is stuff I learned from you. So you're absolutely right. So we'll see how good a student I was. But A, you do need to actually staff a team. You need somebody at a minimum like yourself uh, mm -hmm. and ideally one or two supporting people like the, in that department, like we have now. Uh, yeah. And you're gonna need to sort of section off engineering time and you know, other time of people who, you know, like the SC time to make sure that people can demo show and talk about the product in an intelligent and simple way. So that's, 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 some, that's money, that you could, cause you gotta dedicate yeah. your resources to that. Second thing is that there are reports and um, analyst studies that they do and it's easier to get the attention of analysts. And I don't mean this in a, it's not a pay to play. I think I'd be very careful here, but it's not pay to play. It's not like, oh, if I'm working with Forrester, then somehow things are gonna be better for me. No, no, they're still gonna analyze you legitimately on your merits. But the closer you get to them and the more work you do with them, the more easily you'll understand them and you'll understand what they're looking for because what they're looking for is what their customers are asking. So it is, I think, an interesting way of creating customer intimacy by working more closely. And then the third thing is, um, is you just like how you take what you get out of analyst relations and then leverage that in a marketing plan. Like how do you talk about it on LinkedIn and how do you allow your employees to do employee advocacy around it? And how do you do programmatic display advertising around it and all that kind of stuff? And there's a lot of rules around that, but th those feel like three major buckets. So what am I missing? And then maybe we could drill into those buckets and help everyone understand how they make those investments and make those investment decisions. Yeah, you're pretty close. So the way that we have, I yeah, the way that we have score, I got a B plus. You say three categories. I actually, the AR program that I run today has four core components. Of course. Okay. I only got that's our, that. All right. <laughs> that's our, uh, so what I just talked about with briefing and inquiry, that's our proactive engagement. So right. there's, think about, and you can even think about these in terms of buckets of spend as well. Um, so you have proactive engagement. That's all of the stuff that we do to educate analysts about our, our products, our services, our programs, our innovation, our product roadmaps, our investments in the business. Um, evaluative research is a whole other thing. Now that's WAVES and Magic Quadrants or other tier two or tier three industry um, evaluations that we're participating in. These take a lot of time. They take, and that's more of the capital resource allocation that you're talking about. Like, hey, we're gonna need 20 hours of our CEO's time for this right. one Magic Quadrant, right? And that's serious money. It might not cost anything to, to participate in a WAVE or a Magic Quadrant, but the capital that you're investing in terms of resources around the business from product to your executive leadership team, product marketing, and of course your analyst relations resources, it's 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 costly to participate in a wave or a magic quadrant. It, it's probably more costly to do a wave or a magic quadrant without knowing what you're doing, <laughs> but nonetheless, still costly. Um, and then my third bucket is commissioned research. So this isn't this isn't a free thing. Commissioned research doesn't exist for free. Okay, so it's something that you need to be thoughtful about, but it's it's you are working in collaboration with a Forrester or a Gartner or a different analyst firm to create thought leadership or uh, ROI analysis or benchmarking exercises that validate your market position with that third party unbiased Forrester or Gartner logo. This is really, really, this is a really big one because that's a huge lead generation opportunity for your marketing engine. And the last bucket is our paid engagements. And this is a little different than commission research because this is paid engagements. And the way that I think about it is how is it's strictly like webinars, speaking opportunities and opportunities for in a closed door setting for an analyst that's in your space to meet with your executive leadership team or your product management team to talk about competitive intelligence and figure out how you can turn the needle in terms of influence with with an analyst. Yeah, and I think that, again, I, I sort of sometimes see people maybe roll their eyes a little bit and kind of like wink and go, oh yeah, like, you know, if we pay them, then they're gonna give us a good rating. And I, I really try to disabuse people of that notion really quickly because it's very cynical and inaccurate. And, but, but what does happen, and let's talk about this a little bit, mm. there's a virtuous cycle that I have seen happen. I've seen you lead this, right? So I, I again, I sort of, I'm the student here. I've seen you lead this virtuous cycle where the ongoing engagement, even when they're like speaking at our events, you know, which we will we'll, we'll pay for that, that ongoing kind of intimacy with the analysts makes us smarter 
not just about how to talk to them, which I think is partly true, but more importantly, I think how we should be evolving our product development and how we should be thinking about talking about our product and how we should be pitching our product to prospects. And just because you're in the ecosystem of the people who are very close to customer queries, because I think what people miss is that the analysts get queries from companies all the time saying, hey, I'm looking for a CCAS provider. Who would you recommend? And, mm. and then they say, well, then they'll ask a bunch of questions. And they all that back and forth informs them in a way that it's very difficult for us to get that insight. So talk to me a little bit about the pay to play cynicism that people sometimes have. And then talk to me about how you would reframe that mindset to get people to think about it in the proper tonality. And then let's talk a little bit about numbers. What, you know, I've got a, say a, at, at 35 million, I'm probably spending eight to 10 million on marketing. How much of that would you spend on analyst relations? So let's break that down a little bit. Yeah, so the pay to play stuff, it comes up in every in every conversation that I ever have when I'm when I'm talking with somebody. And the truth is this, Greg, there's there are levers that you can pull and there's levers that you just can't pull. Like there's influence to be had in some paid engagements, but in the big heavy things, there's not a whole lot. So I'll also mention this from an analyst perspective, if you're an analyst at a Gartner or Forrester and I've been there, right? you likely have no idea how much a sprinkler or any other vendor that you're talking to is spending on is spending with your company, if any at all. Right, right. right. You just don't know. You don't have access to that information. Right, right. So if you're an analyst, you're sitting there and you, you don't have access to a CRM that tells you, oh, a sprinkler, we got to pay better attention to them because they're spending right. this much money. Or, oh, oh, hey, sprinkler, we're only going to give them a little bit of ear service because they're not spending enough money with us. That doesn't exist. Analysts don't know how much you spend with them. That's a great they have direction. no idea. Yeah. But... There are some levers that you can pull that 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 do drive influence, and it's not because of the money that's attached to it. It's because of the activity. It's because of the engagement. It's because of that opportunity to build relationships and sentiment and gain mind share between somebody. I always tell people this. When you're starting a, a path with a new analyst, what I want you to focus on the most is finding those areas of, of commonality. Where do you agree on things? Have, have baseline conversations about the things that you agree on. Build rapport, and then only then can we start to – introduce some conversations that challenge some things that we, that we, that, uh, where we see things differently. Well, one um, thing I think our founder does really well, Raji is, uh, he's always been hardcore on reading the last year to two years, depending a little bit on the rate of publishing by the analysts, but yeah. he'll read 10, 15, uh, reports written by the analysts we're about to meet with. And he'll have those, in his brain and he'll know what their perspective is. And you'll see Raji uh, in meetings actually referring to comments they've made in previous studies and either saying, and we agree with that, that's consistent with our point of view, or he'll say, you know, you said it was, you know, X, and we actually think it's Y. And, and this is why our point of view is different from yours, but he's, he's always very clear to show, I think there's two things that are happening there. One is a great sign of respect to the analyst that you've cared enough to read their work, uh, which they obviously spent a lot of time on is important to them. And, uh, and number two, you're getting into their head so that you're talking to them in a way that they can understand where you're coming from and they can frame you correctly. And I, I've always, uh, Raji was, is very hardcore on that practice. And you've brought that now into kind of common practice with the whole team. You distribute everything in advance. You do a great job of making sure everyone's sort of coached up and kind of, connected to all the right materials, but let's talk about that a little bit, like understanding the analysts you're going to be working with and spending time reading those things, which I also think is also a virtuous cycle in terms of oh, understanding been, the company. Totally. And I've been part of a million conversations with analysts where there's so much friction because there's disagreement. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it never goes well at all. It never goes well at all. It's not going to, it's, it's going to, it's going to hurt you in the long run. Um, but, uh, when we create these avenues of things that are paid engagements, like let's say we're doing a commission thought leadership piece or we're, we're doing an ROI analysis or something, it gives, I've created then a platform for folks like you or folks like our CEO, Raji, to have one-to-one -one engagement over a prolonged period of time in order to help an analyst get to a finish line of a publication that we've, yeah, okay, we've sponsored it. But when that thing comes out, we've got mind share. We've right. agreed. We've we'd agreed on a hypothesis, gone out together to prove it, and then published it together. And that's something that doesn't change easily. 
And it, and through that, through the act of that engagement, we've not only just proved a hypothesis that is a universal truth of our value proposition with the analysts that we care about, but if you don't have a good understanding of how analysts analysts are are like KPI'd in their own roles, then you don't really have a really good baseline for understanding what levers are good ones to pull and which levers are not good ones to pull. And how are and they KPI'd? Case, yeah, exactly. So an analyst is just like any one of us. We work at a company. They have performance KPIs, right? And I don't think that this is too much secret sauce, but some of these engagements that we tend to, the levers that we will pull that are paid engagements are going to help our analysts that we care about be more successful in their roles than other ones that we could pull that don't really impact their their performance at all. Interesting. I had not thought of it that way before. I like that. It's good framing. So yeah, unintended... There was one thing too, the, the same thing goes for your support team too. So if you're working with a Forrester or a Gartner, mm -hmm. you've got your analyst community, but you also have a whole host of other people that you work with. They're project managers, they're account managers, they're research coordinators, and you want to enable all of these people that support your organization. Here at Sprinkler, we've got a dozen people at Forrester or a dozen people at Gartner that support our contract or support our account with them. And it's my job to make sure that every one of those people along the journey to my best ability are being successful in their roles because they're going to be that much more, they're that much more able, willing, and, uh, you know, hungry to help us in the future when we need it. Let's say I need a grad needs to talk to an analyst yesterday and I need to make that happen. Typically through normal channels, it might take a couple of weeks for that to happen, but you might have a meeting with the board this week and you need right. to get some information or you need to get a sounding board right. and probably make that happen if we're enabling our account teams to be successful too. That's awesome insight. I love that. So let's talk about budgeting. So, you know, I'm spending eight to 10 million bucks on my marketing budget right now. I'm not spending any money on analyst relations. I haven't really thought about it. Um, you know, here's grad and drew like pounding the table and saying, Hey, this is really important. You got to do this. Um, the CEO, I'm thinking, wow, what do I carve out for this? How would you, how would you think about that? Well, as a baseline, you need entitlement to their research services, which will buy, which which will also give you access to analysts. And it's usually unmetered, so you can talk to the analysts as much as you'd like to. Um, for a firm like a Gartner or a Forrester, just a just an entry level uh, access and entitlement to research and engagement services is going to cost you between fifty and a hundred grand. So I would set aside just to get a relationship started, a couple hundred a couple hundred bones, and that should get you going. Um, but then we can talk about like taking it to the next levels. Like we're, when you're at a, when you're at a point where like sprinkler is, we're, we're a public company now where are you allowed to talk about revenue about sprinkler on this thing or what? No, no, we don't do that. Well, you can, well we only, we would uh, only share, well, you guess you can, I guess we would only share what we've shared publicly. Mm -hmm. I don't talk about sprinkler a ton on the show. I talk about unified CXM mostly, but, uh, so we could say that in the last earnings call, our CFO did reveal that we have a half a billion dollar run rate. I think that's where you were going, right? Yeah, that's where uh, I so was. So that's going. public information. So we can anything that's public, we can we can talk about. And that's that was like right on the earnings call. So yeah, we're at a we're at a pretty decent scale, right? We're we're a ten x versus this theoretical company that I'm talking about. Don't quote me, but I think it's right in the ballpark. Ten percent of our marketing budget. Really? Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't talk about what our marketing budget is, but so we're going back to our eight to $10 million marketing budget. See, I'm taking us to the series C company because I want to keep it really far away from sprinkler. You see what I'm doing here? Yeah. Right. So, and so, so in the, so series C, so I'm spending eight to 10 million bucks. You'd be saying you should be spending 800 to a million bucks on your analyst program, which does sound right to me. Yeah. Uh, things like an analyst event. You know, let's talk about that. We haven't really, that really hasn't come up yet, but oh, that's totally know. different. Well, you might need to double the budget just to do a successful analyst event. Okay. Okay. So what would an analyst event look like and why would you do it? <laughs> They're lavish. They're lavish. And a lot of the competitors in our market in particular, like especially that CCAS market and other like front office marketing technologies, they put together some serious analysts, analyst events. You're telling me about one. Don't use any names. Okay. So don't use any competitor names here, but you're telling me about one that I think involved helicopters. Was I, did I hear yeah, that one? It, okay. It so that, like that, just, just, just to give people an example of what a, what a, a, a just and this is not a crazy big company and this is not a crazy over the top analyst event but just just to give people a taste no, of what's going on out there you remember the you remember the example i would think that they're 
over a billion in revenue. I, I'm pretty yeah, sure. I'm getting close to that. Yeah, something yeah. Something in that ballpark. Okay, so they did the whole Yellowstone like experience. You you watch Yellowstone yet? No. Oh my god, you got to watch Yellowstone. I know. Everyone tells me I have to watch it. <laughs> it's, yeah, so I'm still I'm still working my way through the new Sex in the City, and I'm rewatching <laughs> Billion season three so I can watch season four and understand it. So so yeah, I got I got my yeah. my plate's full right now. Yeah. <laughs> but you're I gonna get lose, to, I'll get you're to gonna it. lose a you're gonna lose a month of your life in Yellowstone. And you're gonna yeah, no, I'm it. almost afraid to watch Yellowstone. So many people have told me how much I'm gonna love it. I'm afraid to actually watch it. So because I know I'm just gonna like disappear for a while, and you know. They'll be sending like search dogs for me and stuff like that. So this company, this company, which also is kind of one of our competitors, and I keep an eye on this stuff because you know that's it's it's a very similar pool of analysts, right? So they flew everybody into either Helena or Billings, Montana, and from there, I've been to Billings. Yeah, so from there, had each person picked up in an in a in a a helicopter, flown into a private ranch in Montana where they had an analyst summit over the course of several days. And they did like, um, they, they, of course they do all of the stuff that you do in an analyst summit where you're doing like product information, you're doing a CEO address. You might invite, you might invite a guest speaker, you're doing product demonstrations, you're doing all of the stuff that needs to get done. But in addition to that, they're doing, they did, it was like a gun range thing that happened. There was horseback riding that happens. Of course, Carson the sightseeing, West. the sightseeing tour around the Teton Mountains with the helicopter rides, these things get pricey, and there's no, there's no ceiling to it. Um, so, how many analysts do you think they would have invited, and how much do you think they spent on that event? I think they invited between twenty and thirty analysts and influencers. Okay, I think that they spent seven figures on that event, like more than a million dollars. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that I mean, but that's, that's a smart company. That's a company that knows about the zero moment of truth. It understands that this is where the buying journey starts. And if they get it wrong at that stage, you can't really turn it around with a bunch of programmatic display ads. <laughs> you've got to, like, you've got to get it right. That's a market where a technology company like that is getting 75 to 80% of their leads straight through analyst relations. Right, right, right. I mean, their whole game. it's their whole game. Right, you may you may you may look at your marketing plan as primarily an analyst relation plan. That's a category where uh, a major and, and a couple actually major analyst evaluations, Magic Quadrants or Wave, have existed for that category for twenty years. And if you're not a leader in that space, then you aren't on a short list. Nobody's considering buying unless you're unless you're a leader in that space. And the leaders in that space have maintained their leadership for over a decade. People are probably dying to know who we're talking about, but we're not going to tell you. Uh, all right, unless you pay us a lot. They also money. say this. They also say this, Greg. It's pretty common for analysts, uh, for firms like uh, Gartner, they report that uh, as much as 50% of category revenue is owned by the leaders of that market. So if you're a leader in a magic quadrant, Interesting. 50% okay. of the market category. Of course, Gartners and Foresters, they create their own market categories. So, yeah. uh, so do with that what you will. But... Fifty percent, and typically, on average, there's usually three or four leaders in every evaluation. That unless that's you, that sounds about right. Yeah, three or four companies, fifty percent. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you you'd mentioned in our sort of pre-briefing that there are sometimes there are unintended consequences to these yeah. analysts. Really. So talk to me. Talk to me a little bit about that. I can't wait to hear this. So I've had a really cool journey here. So it's been four years and I was the first of my kind. There was no analyst relations department here That's right. before, before I came. And one of the coolest things and the most proud things that, that I encounter on a daily basis is when you're in a company like Sprinkler that's gone through an IPO and grows so fast. I mean, we were, Grad, we were a thousand people when, when you and I joined. And we're what? What are we now? I don't think we're public with that number, but many, many Big. more. So it's a it's a many X's, many X's, yes, many X's. Um, people every day uh, hit me up on Slack and send me emails and stuff internally. When when, for example, my newsletter publishes, I'll get I'll get emails from people, and they tell me that uh, Sprinkler's recognition as a leader in various categories that we participate in, waves and magic quadrants specifically, was a was a determining factor, and then joining Sprinkler. 
Wow, so that's neat. For recruiting. Wow, good for you. It's a huge recruiting tool. Yeah, wow, that must feel great. Look at the thousands of lives that you've influenced. By the way, uh, for the audience, uh, so you, you publish a wonderful newsletter. Uh, we're actually working on a newsletter uh, right now, and we're using your template as our base template. And, uh, and it's called Analyze This, which I thought was super duper funny. <laughs> That was great. Um, nice template, though. Uh, all done through Sprinkler too. It's all powered by Sprinkler. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful job on that. So I really love your. When you I go, love when your... you use your template, make sure you run it through the brand team because I, I got check check. Something. Yeah, no, I, I know, I know. I always talk to Jan, <laughs> uh, but uh, but I loved what you did. So I thought Thank it was really you. nice, nice piece of work and well written with lots of punchy like what why what am I learning? It was, it was really well done in terms of being well, able to pull that's value out of it. You. Credit to Karen or other, our analyst relations manager on my team. She, awesome. She Thank you, Karen. Her. Great work. Great work. Mm -hmm. It's a really great piece of work. Okay. So, so, uh, keep going unintended consequences. Recruiting. So number one is recruiting. And number yeah. two was, um, I never expected this to happen, but one of the biggest bright spots of my career so far here at Sprinkler was going through an IPO. Um, Nobody ever tells you that this is going to happen, but there's a huge road show. Grad, you were probably in the room for all of this stuff. When you're going around to, to all of the different investment institutions that are going to help you get to a, a financial milestone like that, slide number two in that deck is all of the analyst relations trophies that you, that you collected over the years. And it's, it's the industry's way of validating the strength of your technology and the That's viability right. of your market. So, right. um, so, I thought, so I thought when you said the highlight of your career – just for a second, I thought you were going to say working with me, but I, I guess uh, I got, I'll still I'll focus. I'll focus more. I'll try to do better. I've learned more from from you than, <laughs> than any, anybody I have in my career. Well, well I'll give nice. you that. So you didn't have to say that. For better or for worse. It. For better or for worse. Oh, good and bad, right? Yeah. Mostly, I've learned what not to do. <laughs> Sometimes it's what not to do. Right? You know? I actually said that to my dad once. He was like, you know, what lessons you learned from me? I said, oh, a lot of things about what not to do. I don't think he appreciated that very much, but you know, it was true. Um, all right, so this has been this has been great. So I'm um, I'm feeling like if I'm if I'm talking to this the CEO of our theoretical Series C company, I think he's thinking, wow, I am really not investing when I should be investing here, uh, and I'm not thinking about this in um, as holistic and sort of deep way as I need to. Um, so. Let's let's coach this person up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so how do you? Because it's also a little overwhelming. Like, where do I get started, and how do I find a Drew? And I'll, I mean, we had to go to Singapore to find you. It's you know halfway around the world to to sort of find you. It's not you're not just like people like yourself are not just falling out of the trees. So, right. What do I do next, and how do I get going? And is there a way for me to scale this with a, a vendor model, or how do I get rolling more rapidly if I? while I wait to find like my perfect analyst relations person. Yeah. So first, the first things Forbes published a, an article this past week, the top 15 jobs in demand in 2023. And number 10 was analyst relations. Really? That's number cool. 10. This is the Forbes article. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. um, the, the people are recognizing how important this is in, in terms of really scaling businesses, especially in B2B technology. Right. Um, I would say this, I would say, I would say if you're a series C and you haven't gotten your foot wet with analyst relations yet, first of all, you need to do a little bit of analysis in terms of what's the scope of analyst coverage for your market. If you're a sprinkler and you've got several pl uh, product suites that have our, right. we, we track 60 right. to 70 analysts across five different markets. Great point. And, and it's, it's a very, very com complex ecosystem of analysts, right? So you need to have some serious resources behind a program that's going to be successful for a company like ours and technologies like ours. But in a lot of markets, like you might be a technology that's in, um, you know, like identity verification or proofing or something like that, that has much more of a narrow focus, right? You're right. essentially you're essentially a, a point solution, right? And it's a deep category that has a lot of uh, tenured analysts in it, but maybe there's only five or six analysts that are really going to move the needle in terms of your analyst relations program and what kind of earn side assets you're going to get out of that program. If that's the case, then you're going to take different approaches to it. If you're a sprinkler more on our side of the fence, you're going to need to dedicate some time to looking for somebody that's like me, has a background similar to me. And it's not a cheap investment. You're investing in a program and you're going to have to like 
understand that with this type of investment comes, hey, we're going to we're going to find somebody that's capable and has deep level experience of doing this kind of thing. But also that's just the beginning of the investment, because what you're going to invest in the program is going to be a factor more four or five, six times more than that. But if you're somebody that operates in a point solution and you haven't yet started to tap into the value that analyst relations brings you, I would actually probably advise that CEO to start with a firm. Right. So there's lots of different analyst relations consulting firms that are around okay. that for a, a fraction of the cost of bringing a Drew can start to really turn the needle. Well, your pizza budget alone is crazy. Like, I'm just going to put that out there. So it you gotta, it's really uh, it's, uh, it's really off, off the charts. So <laughs> what would be an example of an analyst firm? Do you have any? Yeah, there's one that yeah. I've, I've actually looked into augmenting some of our capabilities with firms before. There's one that's called Spotlight. There's another one that's called like AR Insight. There's one that's based in the UK that's quite big as well. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Um, maybe we'll put it into like the, the notes here in your podcast. But um, for a fraction of the notes. No, no notes. Okay. Well, it all but, happens in real time. You know, so this is way. we don't edit it either. So. No, this is just going to be straight raw, all so the way through. Always raw, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Every mistake I make, publicly available. Yeah. Well, okay. It so gives, it, it, it makes Randy happy. So, so that's right, Randy. Like it's the, it's the, it's the mistakes that are fun, and sometimes I feel like Randy throws me just, just for the hell of it. <laughs> but he's show notes. Oh, we have show notes, okay. and we do have show notes. We will have notes. So, so wait, back on track. Uh, a firm like a Spotlight would be yeah. really good at, at sort of like the coordination of analyst activities that need to happen. And they'll also yeah. be pretty well equipped to coach your executive leadership team right. into, like, into discussions that need to happen. So they'll coordinate all that stuff. They'll manage the relationship. And then they'll coach your executive team just to have those high level briefings and inquiries that need to that you need to do to establish relationships once you've then like established relationships and you see the direction that the relationship is going in you can then start more casually slowly looking for the right fit to to manage a, a program at scale but getting started you don't need to you don't need to find a drew like you can there's other things that you can do that's great coaching that's and this is coaching. not this yeah. is not my my bid for grad to replace drew with, a, with an analyst relationship. <laughs> Yeah, like, like God slowly puts down the phone. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's a that is actually that is good advice because part of the problem that all all these startups are having is just finding people has become really challenging, mm -hmm. and it's getting difficult to scale a lot of these things. And they're and they're sort of sitting there waiting to find a whole bunch of very important roles that are difficult to hire and difficult to find, and it, it's tough. Uh, and I've seen more and more sort of agency like models spring up in all sorts of different ways. And, you know, actually I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of that model. I mean, when we built the customer experience center at Microsoft, we scaled it by using Jeffrey M and we had a, a vendor based model where they were, they were what called, uh, um, orange badges. So they had access to Microsoft facilities. They had a Microsoft badge, but it was like slightly different. The blue badges were full-time employees and orange badges were vendor employees, but they had kind of you know, full access and you could, you know, work with them as like, like they were internal employees, but you also had the flexibility to manage them like a vendor. And so that, yeah. that model worked. It took us a while to get to that. We failed two solid resounding times before that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but once we got that model and, and the Jeffrey M folks are amazing too. So that, that just sort of worked, but I, I think that model in these spaces, I'm always, whenever I am kind of advising, I'm always saying, Look for that to scale right now because you might need to scale back or you might need to scale up super fast. And in both cases, it's really hard to do it with a full-time employee perspective. That's great. So, so Drew, this has been awesome. Uh, and I appreciate the time. This has been really fantastic. Uh, what, what else would you give our theoretical CAO as advice or what advice would you give people generally who are thinking about analyst relations? This is kind of a chance for you to kind of put a button on all this. Like the one thing you should make sure you do is, you know, never open the hood at 60 miles an hour or something like that. Right? So what's the, what's the thing that you would say, the kind of thing you'd really focus on and really think about, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap if that's, uh, if that's enough. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so analyst relations as a practice isn't going anywhere. 
firms like Gartner's and Forrester's are only continuing to grow. Yeah. Uh, there was a time eight years ago, 10 years ago, where I started at Gartner that our share price was trading at $13 a share. Gartner trades at $350 a share today. The company has grown really? so big and they're only a, they're, their, whole, their whole growth strategy is based in acquisition. If you look at, if you look at adjacent, adjacent functions within, within the marketing organization, like um, uh, customer review sites and competitive and intelligence. The crowd and Capterra. Gartner. Yeah. Gartner is acquiring the G2 crowds and trust radiuses. So the, well, they, have the pure, they have pure insights now, right? That's the Gartner. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In a natural very, extension. Very yeah. At Mar the, I'm going to say it here. In the next three to five years, either a trust radius or a G2 crowd will be acquired by Gartner. That's how they grow. That's what or they Forrester. do. Or Forrester, for that or matter. Constellation. Or Constellation. Sure. Could be any of the above. Could be. Yeah. Okay. And there's a hundred other little firms that have. So the, the discipline of analyst relations as, as a career path is going to continue to stay in place. It's going to continue to grow. And some of the capabilities that you need to be able to do that job effect effectively are going to grow. And it's going to grow into some competitive intelligence. It's going to grow into some customer, um, customer engagement functions. Um, so I don't think it's going anywhere. And if there's anything, people that are thinking of breaking in, I think the best way to break in is kind of the path that I took. There's great opportunities at firms that are analyst firms to get into and understand how that machine works, right? There's been nothing that's been more effective for me in my career than understanding how the levers inside of those systems are pulled and what they mean when they are pulled. Because on my side now, I'm able to effectively use those tools to, to drive influence. And, um, I think that that's probably been the biggest asset of my career is, you know, being able to take that experience and parlay it into a role where I'm actually helping a company grow. Wow. That is a great, that is a great summary, great button on this. I really appreciate that. And Drew, I'm just going to say one more time. I really appreciate you. Uh, you have done an extraordinary Aww. job for Sprinkler. Um, really, um, I mean, I didn't find you and I, I guess I sort of signed the, the offer papers and stuff like that. But geez, I, I mean, it was me show that really brought you in, which is like Paul did a great job there, but man, it's just been amazing. I, I, I really have valued and really enjoyed uh, working with you and our relationship mm -hmm. has been fantastic. And, and just seeing you continuously uh, up your game uh, as we've continued to kind of expand the number of categories that we're in, like it really is a, a monster program now and, and it, it didn't is. start out that way. So you, you just, doing an incredible job. So Thanks thank so you very, very much. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap now, if you don't mind. And uh, do you have anything else to add or just uh, do you have like a, any kind of like, you know, a website address or LinkedIn or anything? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Thanks good? so much okay. for having me. This has All been right. super fun. I'd like to come again. Please have me again sometime. You're welcome anytime. All right. For the Unified CXM Experience, I'm Grad Khan, Chief Experience Officer at Sprinkler, and today we were interviewing Drew Tambling, who's the Director of Analyst Relations and Influencer Relations uh, at Sprinkler. Uh, Drew uh, kind of gave us his insight in how you can use Analyst Relations to leverage the marketing motions in the zero moment of truth. And we're going to come back on uh, other, uh, we're going to talk about reviews pretty soon in the next zero moment of truth piece, and we'll be obviously, obviously digging into the other pillars. So that's it for today, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.